Hello, welcome to the first in the autumn season of Exploring Research Seminars, Racial Difference in the Anglophone Caribbean. Thank you to our speaker, Dr. Rana Hogarth, and to all of you for joining us this evening. My name is Owen McCarney, and I'm a Research Development Specialist at Welcome Collection. To improve access, we encourage contributors to provide a brief visual description of themselves. I'm a white man with brown hair in a dark blue shirt sat in a meeting room at Welcome. My preferred pronouns are he and him. Our program of exploring research seminars showcases current work that draws upon our collections to explore topics relevant to how we all think and feel about health. For recordings of previous seminars, please see the What's On page of the Welcome Collection website. The autumn season, which this talk opens, covers the period up until around 1850. Before introducing this evening's speaker, I have to cover some housekeeping points. The event will run for one hour. Rana's presentation should last for around 40 minutes, then there will be time for questions. Please post these in the Q&A throughout proceedings. If you have any technical issues, post about these in the general chat and my colleagues will do their best to help resolve them. It should go without saying that all communication should be kept relevant and respectful. This session is being recorded. Names will be anonymized in the recording. A link will be sent out via Eventbrite afterwards, but could end up in your spam folder. You should be able to set up automated closed captions under the settings menu. Please let us know if there's anything else we can do to improve access to our events. At the end of the seminar, we'll post a link to a feedback form in the chat. This will also be sent out with the recording link. Please use it to let us know how we're doing, what sort of research you're interested in hearing more about, and how else we might improve our program. Great pleasure to introduce this evening's speaker, Dr. Rana Hogarth. It is also an appropriate coincidence that it is currently Black History Month in Britain. I wanted to highlight, though, that this is a coincidence, because we aim to better represent more diverse perspectives and better address issues such as the subject of this evening's talk all year round. In any case, when Rana's name came up as a potential contributor, colleagues shared my own enthusiasm about a speaker of her caliber, presenting research that draws upon our collections to address vital historical questions. She's an associate professor in the Department of History at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, received her PhD in History of Science and the History of Medicine from Yale in 2012. Her scholarship interrogates conceptions of racial difference in North America and the Caribbean as they emerge through the language of medicine and science. Her current research interrogates links between slavery era discourse about the fitness and unfitness of black people and the preoccupation of eugenicists with race crossing in the early decades of the 20th century. Her talk this evening draws upon her research from her first book, Medicalizing Blackness, Making Racial Difference in the Atlantic World, 1780 to 1840 which was published in 2017 and which I cannot recommend enough. Without further ado, over to you, Rana. Well, um, thank you so much for this very um, generous introduction. Um, I would like to just also provide um, a brief visual description of myself. Um, I'm a black woman with my brown hair pulled back into a ponytail. I'm wearing a gray sweater or I suppose a jumper um, with my favorite black blazer. And I am sitting in a room um, with white walls and there is a painting hanging beside me or behind me, excuse me. Um, I use she, her pronouns. So um, what I want to do today is um, I'll share, um, or I guess we'll share a couple of um, slides for my presentation. And what I want to do is um, talk to you a little bit about the process of race making in medical history. And I'm interested in how physicians viewed race and racial difference in the late 18th century, um, early 19th century. And so um, if we see the first slide, if I can see that, then um, I'll start off with a little bit of a quotation. I think is a very arresting quotation. Um, here it is. So I actually found this when I was doing um, my first round of research as a graduate student for my first book. This is um, a quotation from John Coakley Letsom, who is perhaps uh, maybe well known to some of you 
and is a founder of Medical Society of London. Uh, this is my transcription of some of his notes. And I think it's a good way to start us off in a conversation about racial difference. So he says, quote, the Africans differ from Europeans in color, shape, intellects, and affections by gradations which difference of species arise from Adam or not, we don't know. It seems probable that the only one species did, that there have been others since Cain when he went out and was afraid of being killed by other men. However it was, we have now a great clarity. The Africans have a black Rita Mikosum, different features, and short curling hair, end quote. Now, there's a bit of sort of biblical text in here, but also a bit of anatomy. And here we see Letsum essentially saying, we can apprehend differences. We can see them and read them on the body. And he makes reference to different layers of skin and thinking about pigmentation. Now, I start us here because Letsum's words will really tell us um, sort of the way that I think a lot of us still see race, right? We read it on someone's body. We assume we can just sort of see race and then see differences. But I want to move us away from anatomy a little bit, and I want us to move us away from simply a visual idea about difference in race. And as this talk is going to show, we can think about racial difference and race making by paying attention to the ways in which um, differences in suffering and differences in disease susceptibility help to make this idea of race. So if we go to the next slide, um, you will again see um, another quotation. I promise it won't only be quotations, but um, here is sort of a different way of thinking about race. And this comes to us from Benjamin Rush. Again, probably a very well-known figure to many of you. He was an American physician. Um, he was an abolitionist, uh, much like uh, John Coakley Letzum, um, very much opposed to slavery, very much um, considered to be an authority and well-respected. And in scribbling, um, you know, looking at his scribbling in his notes, I was sort of uh, struck by this particular passage. He writes, quote, a fact from Dr. Mosley of the indifference in which Negroes submit to operations in surgery in the West Indies. Even in this country, the Negroes have been observed to handle fire without an emotion and not suffering from it like white people, end quote. This is a reference to pain. The idea that this group of people, right, and he's talking about um, people of African descent, seem to have a higher pain tolerance. Now, if that might sound familiar to some of you, there, there was a study that came out in 2016 that, that was very disturbing in that it revealed many people still hold these very wrong-headed views. But here is something that we see from the 18th century. And if we just um, click through uh, again on this slide, um, you'll see um, when I say the scribblings, um, I, as a historian, I'm rather nosy, so I do indeed look at people's lecture notes. Um, if you click again, um, you'll see that I've sort of highlighted exactly where this passage come from. But of course, being a historian is not just about being nosy. You track down sources, you track down references, and you try to understand context. So if we click again, um, we find that this Mosley is, is none other than, of course, Dr. Benjamin Mosley, a very well-known British physician who did spend time living and working in Jamaica. So he had plenty of um, opportunity to make comparisons between blacks and whites. And it is indeed from um, Dr. Mosley where we get this statement. So if we look at this particular um, edition of uh, the treatise on tropical diseases and of the climate of the West Indies, there is that reference, that Rush paraphrase. Now, I just want to be clear that um, in some senses, historians have said, well, perhaps Mosley was responding to abolitionists. Perhaps he was um, not really meaning this to be taken at face value. The issue was, however, that it was taken at face value. And Benjamin Rush actually cited Mosley as an authority. So here is a way in which we can think about how an idea about difference in pain tolerance actually circulated. And we can trace this in the historical record by looking at some of these primary documents, these unpublished manuscripts, and then seeing sort of the reference in a published manuscript. So essentially what I want us to do then is to think about this idea of racial difference moving beyond simply skin. It's manifest in the ways that physicians understood susceptibility to disease and pain tolerance. And what I want to do now is use the example of yellow fever to really um, illustrate to you how ideas about um, innate racial difference really sort of propagated and then circulated amongst, again, these are elite, um, well-respected medical men that sort of became sort of accepted as fact. So if we move to the next slide, we'll see, um, yellow fever, right, which is, um, I should say, in the 18th century, 
extremely feared, right? This is um, considered to be the kind of disease that could clear out cities. Um, it was horrifying. Um, it still is a very dangerous hemorrhagic fever. Um, and it was very, very prevalent in parts of the West Indies or in the, the Caribbean, um, and also parts of the uh, Southern, uh, what is now the United States, and also parts of Western Africa. So this disease was sort of, um, it was all around the Atlantic world, let's say. Um, if you said the words yellow fever, people would know exactly what you meant and would likely um, try to flee if they had the means to do so. So the disease could progress rather rapidly. Um, it had very telltale um, signs, um, again, as it being a hemorrhagic fever. People instantly sort of kind of knew this is a kind of yellow fever once um, it made itself known. Now, there was an assumption that circulated in the 18th century and, and gained traction well into the 19th century that Black people were innately immune to yellow fever. And it was on account of their race. So what I'm going to do now is, is really focus on that idea and how it circulated, but I will also pay, pay special attention to what that meant for British military ambitions and empire building ambitions um, in the Caribbean. So if we move to the next slide, um, I will offer uh, just a little bit of um, context. So in the 18th century, many physicians, um, and we'll find soon Benjamin Rush included, believed that yellow fever attacked individuals based on their race. Um, the idea was that white people or Europeans, people who were um, unacclimatized to the Americas, so this includes the Caribbean and, and North America, were considered to be vulnerable to this disease. While black people were re frequently regarded as naturally immune, or in some cases, less likely to suffer much from its ravages. Now, I just wanna be clear that yellow fever does um, give survivors acquired immunity. So if one does uh, you know, come down with yellow fever and survive it, then they will be immune, but that's acquired. It's not based on, on somebody's race. As I mentioned that um, yellow fever is indeed um, endemic to parts of, of Western Africa. And if we understand the slave trade, sort of the movements of people across from Western Africa and being forcibly transported into the Americas, it's very likely that the vector, the mosquito, the Aedes aegypti mosquito may have infected Africans where if they had survived, once they arrived in the Americas, and the disease is brought with them, they, they may have appeared to be completely fine during an epidemic, but that would be because they were already exposed, not because they were black. And so it's really important to just impress upon you at this point. So if we move to the next slide, um, I want to sort of paint a scene for you of how this notion of innate uh, racial difference really takes hold. Um, in Philadelphia and um, in, in the United States, there was a yellow fever epidemic in 1793. This is very well known um, amongst historians as sort of this, this great public health calamity. And so when yellow fever arrives in Philadelphia, uh, this is where Benjamin Rush is based, um, he is sort of called upon as a medical leader and an authority figure to assist during this epidemic. And Benjamin Rush, um, you know, like any good um, physician, read up as much as he could. And what he found were um, several texts that made the claim that, well, Black people are innately immune, they won't suffer. Philadelphia had a free Black population. And as I said, Benjamin Rush was um, an abolitionist. He was very much opposed to slavery. He was actually quite close with members of the Free African Society. So what he does is he kind of writes in his treatises, like reflecting back, he says, quote, I was led to believe that the Negroes in our city would escape it. In consequence of this belief, I published the extract from Dr. Lining's History of Yellow Fever as it had four times appeared in Charleston in South Carolina, end quote. Now what he's doing there in that quotation is saying, look, I read the works of other physicians and they all said, Black people were going to be immune. So Benjamin Rush actually eventually writes a letter to uh, Richard Allen, and, and I'll get to that in just a moment, where he says, can you convince free Africans to stay behind and assist in burying the dead and nursing the sick? And that is precisely what the free Black community does. The problem, of course, is that Black people are not innately immune. And eventually Rush recognizes that he's made a mistake. 
he does observe black people getting the disease. So he does say, okay, I have to revise this, but he revises it in a very um, specific manner. So let's move to the next slide. As you can see, here is the image here. There's um, Dr. Benjamin Rush and there's Richard Allen. So um, these two figures correspond. Benjamin Rush actually wrote a letter to Richard Allen saying, look, we need your help, stay behind. And this is precisely what Richard Allen does. Many Africans stay behind and help. Richard Allen actually contracted yellow fever. Um, he did survive it, but he later uh, penned um, a pamphlet with Absalom Jones basically saying, look, um, this was our experience during the great calamity of the yellow fever um, epidemic. And it makes very clear that black people suffered, even though there was sort of this whole body of medical literature saying, well, black people don't suffer. And so this is what I mean when I say it really comes to a head in the Philadelphia um, yellow fever epidemic. So if we move to the next slide, we will see um, the makeshift hospital. This is Bush Hill, just outside of Philadelphia. And there we see, um, you know, many people were sent there. As I said, this was a great calamity. Um, you kind of have people dying in the streets. You have people um, dying in their houses and they're sort of running out of space. What to do with all of these people? So there's this makeshift hospital. If we go to the next slide, what we will find is the records. Um, and if we click just one more time, um, we'll see that black people were indeed listed amongst the dead. So the point here is to say that black people did indeed suffer. But if we were to only look at just some of these medical texts, you might have the assumption that black people did not. And clearly with Richard Allen's experience, um, with Rush actually backtracking, um, we start to really see a different picture emerge. And that is that black people are not innately immune. Now, I do want to sort of mention this caveat that um, Rush makes, and that is that he says that, okay, Black people do get this disease, but then he says, and I quote here, uh, the disease was lighter in them than the white people. I met with no case of hemorrhage in a Black patient. He also says that they only tended to get um, sick and he mentions this, I observed the greater, greatest number of them to sicken after the morning and evenings became cool. So he's kind of making a very specific claim as to the specific circumstances in which one, black people can get this disease. So when the temperature was colder and that if they do get the disease, well, they don't get any of the terrible part of it, none of the hemorrhage, none of the, the terrible suffering. So if we move to the next slide, what we'll see um, is how this plays out in the Caribbean. Because this idea was not simply confined to mainland North America. Um, as should be clear from uh, one of those earlier slides, uh, these physicians read each other. Physicians in mainland North America read the works of physicians in the Caribbean and, and vice versa. So there's a way in which this idea can circulate. Now I want to draw our attention to uh, the Caribbean because there's just um, really a paper trail. Um, the British military left behind a lot, um, a lot of writing, a lot of documentation. Um, and from there, you really start to see how the idea of um, innate black immunity really took hold and how it actually influenced military strategy. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna give you the whole history lesson of sort of the geopolitics of um, uh, the Caribbean where you, know, you have the French, Spanish and the English, but do know that, for example, um, in the 1790s, when we start thinking about um, what would be the Haitian Revolution, um, the British do in, in some, they do actually try to invade Saint-Domingue during um, the revolution in hopes of sort of securing that uh, as for empire, but it doesn't go very well because many die from yellow fever. Um, and in general, a lot of British expeditions suffered because of so many troops dying of, of fevers, tropical fevers, including yellow fever. Now, to sort of um, to, to stem the tide of this, there was an idea that was actually put into practice, and that was to enlist, to commandeer, in some cases, like enslaved people, or to sort of have um, black people, free black people in some cases, be a part of the military. So I offer you this quotation here, and it says essentially, quote, it seems particularly desirable that a number of Negroes or people of color should be immediately embodied either in a separate corps 
The utility of a body of men of this description, particularly with a view to preserving the health of European troops when on service, is likely to be so very great that I cannot too strongly recommend it to your lordships." End quote. So the idea here is to say, let's spare the lives of European troops. We can have black troops do sort of the um, digging the trenches, doing the sort of set work, in some cases being a part of sort of actual service and fighting, but the idea is to create a separate corps. So if we click again, what we'll actually see, um, this is an image um, of the West India Regiment, uh, which was a regiment of men of African descent, um, part of the British military in the sense that they were there to uh, sort of assist in these operations. Um, many of them actually participated in the attempt to invade uh, Saint-Domingue. Um, again, the idea being that, well, if we have black troops, they won't succumb to yellow fever. So this was all uh, part of strategy, sort of trying to use medical observations uh, to sort of assist in empire building aims. So if we move to the next um, slide, what we'll see is, is sort of this idea of yellow fever really having a foothold in places like Jamaica, for example. And that um, this is just an image, um, you know, taken in part of my research, going to Jamaica, where you actually see this is um, a plaque for the old British Naval Cemetery. And, you know, they mentioned that there are victims um, buried there. Yellow fever is sort of named as one of those diseases. Um, if we click again, you'll actually see that the, the remnants of the cemetery are, are indeed still there. Um, interestingly enough, if you are driving from Norman Manley Airport in Kingston um, on the strip of the road, you'll actually see that there is the cemetery where the bodies of all of these um, the British troops who have succumbed to tropical fevers, including yellow fever. are. So if we move to the next slide, we'll see that there were a number, uh, prol proliferation if you like, of texts by regarded, highly regarded medical men who sort of explained the perils of being in sort of the, 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 the West Indies and the tropics where there are these um, deadly diseases. And some of the titles of these, um, an essay on diseases incidental to Europeans in hot climates with a method of prevent, preventing their fatal consequences this is by James Lind. Um, if we just skip down a bit, we can see um, a, a treatise on the fevers of Jamaica with some observations on the intermittent fever of America and an appendix containing some hints on the means of preserving the health of soldiers in hot climates. That's published by Robert Jackson in 1790. And here again is Benjamin Mosley, a treatise on tropical diseases, on military operations, and on the climate of the West Indies. And this one uh, went through uh, four editions. So the point here is that these guidebooks are meant to sort of suggest there must be a way for us to, to um, conquer this deadly disease environment. How do we preserve the troops' um, health, Europeans' troops' health? What do we do? And there is ways in which they recommend um, you know, diet, changes in diet and custom, where you should have barracks and sort of high in the mountains where the temperatures are cooler. But there's also this sense that we should probably have black troops as well. So um, why don't we go ahead and just move to the next slide. Now, I should say that not everyone necessarily agreed with this strategy. So for um, British military um, uh, officials and leaders saying, okay, well, this is what makes sense. We'll simply commandeer enslaved people. Um, we will have them work for us. This actually meant taking property from slave owners in Jamaica. And if you think about um, the island of Jamaica, for example, um, it had a population ratio with um, essentially a black majority and white mi minority. And there was a palpable fear of slave insurrection because there were very there were quite a few slave insurrections. So for slave owners, the idea is saying, okay, you're going to commandeer our slaves and you're going to put them in close contact with weaponry. They sort of saw this as did not make sense. They saw this as a loss of their labor, but also opening the potential for rebellion. But military officials felt that there was a value and utility of black soldiers and that outweighed some of these planters' concerns. Um, and so there's been quite a bit um, written on um, three of sort of British military um, and health um, and race. So um, Roger Buckley uh, wrote, quote, the Honorable Henry Dundas was appointed commander in chief of the British army in 1795 and strongly advocated the usefulness of black troops in hot climates where they could withstand the heat and military fatigues better than Europeans. 
Um, I would also um, add that a recent book out um, by Tim Lockley also looks explicitly at the creation of these West India regiments and, and of course the idea of race making that goes behind it. So the point here is to say that people had ideas about innate racial difference, these ideas circulated in medical texts, but they most certainly spilled over into other aspects of life, including um, military strategy. So if we can go ahead and move just to the next slide. I'd like to now really focus on um, a rather arresting story, what's sort of Im embedded within this talk. And this is something that um, I found, again, doing my research for the first book um, at The Welcome. And I was kind of blown away by it. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and share this with you. Um, so what you're gonna see is actually a, um, this is the notebooks, this is a copy of a notebook um, of William Ferguson who was um, a, a military, a medical military inspector. And essentially, um, I should just say a little bit about William Ferguson. He was originally from Scotland. Um, he actually completed his medical education at the University of Edinburgh. So this actually made him stand out because he was formally trained and trained at one of the premier institutions. Um, this, this was not the norm, I should say, for um, a lot of uh, British Army medical personnel. Um, so there weren't necessarily strict rules, let's just say. Um, so Ferguson actually was deployed um, in uh, the West Indies. He actually served time in Saint-Domingue um, during this whole attempt to try and seize uh, that part of uh, the island. And he actually contracted yellow fever, but survived it. So he was intimately familiar with yellow fever. He knew exactly how awful it was. He also um, had plenty of experience um, as a military inspector in the Iberian Peninsula during Napoleonic Wars. Um, he essentially had the experience and the education that made him sort of um, an authority, if you like. But what's interesting though, is that when he was stationed um, in the West Indies, he, he goes to the West Indies um, in 1815. And he is tasked with inspecting and sort of making sure that everything is in good order. Well, in writing in his notebook, um, I stumbled upon this entry. Um, so this is September um, 1815, and he writes from Barbados. Um, and if we just uh, click, um, you'll see the highlighted portion where he references an African Corps having lately arrived here in a most um, distressed and sickly condition. And essentially what he goes on to describe is uh, basically a transport. Uh, I believe it was a ship called the Regalia that was coming from Sierra Leone. Um, certainly black troops were in some cases taken from, actually taken from uh, Western Africa in some cases. They show up with yellow fever. So he says that he, he describes a yellow fever outbreak. He describes epidemic yellow fever. And he references that this, this, the shipload of, of Africans have arrived and they're filling the hospitals and they shouldn't be because the assumption is, is that they're gonna be fine. They can withstand any of these tropical diseases and they most certainly would not get yellow fever. So for me, I, I you know, as the researcher, I was thinking, huh, I've just read all of these treatises where everyone's told me, you know, this is what people believed and here are people making military decisions and here is somebody who's actually stationed there recognizing, well, this is not true. This is not what my experience is showing me. So if we click to the next slide, um, or yeah, just click again on this slide, we'll see um, that he writes to sort of explain how this could have happened. So he notes that you know the, 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 the ships were poorly um, provisioned, but he specifically focuses on the diet that is given to the African recruits. So um, if you if, uh, click on it again, you'll see a highlighted section where he complains that instead of giving them the right diet, the, um, the, the commanding officers were feeding them the same way that they fed European troops, with salt meat and bread. And Ferguson says that they should be given vegetable seasoning. Um, that's the diet that's known to be suited to the African constitution. So in trying to make sense of how it is that these sickly African troops arrive, how it is that they are you know, ill when they should not be, it's rather than saying, okay, maybe they are equally susceptible. He says, well, no, there's something that has interfered with their constitutions. 
um, so if we move to the next slide, um, what we find um, is a series of, of published documents that are meant to explain what happens, because it, it turns out if you show up with, you know, 800 sickened African recruits, somebody is going to notice um, they're filling the hospitals and they are not doing um, what people assume that they would do, and that being fever proof, being able to withstand um, the, the ravages of tropical diseases. Now, I, I, I want to also mention that he thinks there's such a thing as an African constitution, which is, again, clearly a sense of difference inside. It's not just what's on the outside, that there's something about their bodies, their functioning, their physiology that is distinct, and that they needed to be fed in a way that was suited to that kind of physiology and that kind of um, makeup, constitutional makeup. So um, if we uh, click again, we'll see sort of the, this leads to a great publication, right? So again, fascinating for me as the historian is that I see these unpublished uh, journals that he keeps handwritten, and then I see what he publishes, right? And he is again referencing precisely this um, transport, the regalia, with black recruits coming from the coast of Africa arriving in Barbados in 1815. Um, if we uh, click again, we'll see that what Ferguson wants to do is make sense of why these black troops get sick, um, but why they get sick in a way that's different from the white people in Barbados who also come down with a sickness. Now, I want to be really clear here because this is where it might get um, uh, very uh, sort of difficult to, to, to parse. But the issue is, is that while we know of yellow fever as like a specific disease entity, like it's just yellow fever and these are the symptoms, in the um, late 18th century and early 19th century, there was an idea that there could be different yellow fevers, like different sort of strains of it, different, and it could act differently, right? That there's an idea of yellow fevers and that people might respond differently to yellow fevers based on their constitutions. And so you can see in one of these um, publications, he's interested in understanding why this quote morbific power, so this would be the, the miasmas that he thinks are responsible, operated differently on the blacks and the whites. And he says this might be explained by the fact that the African is very rarely amenable to those influences that affect white men with intermittent, remittent, or yellow fevers. If they operated at all, therefore, on them, they must have produced some other disease. But I see no reason to attribute the dysentery of the blacks from which so many perish to other causes than those that have been proved to exist. So he's sort of saying, look, these Africans are tending to show cases of dysentery, but they're all laboring under the same kind of aura of sickness on these transports. And it's yellow fever, but it's being manifest differently. And I should say this, it was actually quite common um, knowledge at this time period to assume that people of African descent tended to have um, greater manifestation of um, bowel complaints when laboring under sickness. And these are, the, these are the kind of statements you might find in plantation, plantation management guidance. So if we click again, um, we'll see that for um, Ferguson, what he wants to do is sort of explain this, right? He's got to explain how this calamity has taken place, how it's transpired. And what he does is he kind of repeats that same notion again of, oh, well, it must have been diet, right? It's not a sense of saying, okay, well, you know, they are just susceptible. And who's to say that, you know, people weren't actually looking for, you know, the fevers, the, the symptom of fever in some of these black recruits because they didn't think that they should, they would find it anyway. And they maybe either dismissed it or didn't bother to pay attention to it. But rather than even saying, okay, they can, are equal opportunity susceptible to this. The idea was, nope, it was definitely their diet. And so he goes on a whole um, discussion, again, about how vegetable diets are the kinds of things that you want to feed to Africans. Um, it is unclear, he does not state um, where he necessarily gets this idea that vegetable, um, are suit vegetables are suitable to an African constitution. But the point here really is to say he goes through um, quite a bit of, of reasoning to explain away this case of Africans who show up sickened um, by the sort of a source, the same source that causes yellow fever, and that should not be the case. Now, I do want to say again that um, Ferguson is not necessarily, you know, the only uh, British physician to hold a kind of um, view. Uh, I would say that there are writings, um, and again, there's like too much to include, but uh, there's um, the Edward Nathaniel Bancroft is known for suggesting that, you know, when people did see cases of, of people of African descent getting yellow fever, 
you know, he would make the claim that, well, they probably were in um, a colder climate or they were transported to a place that was not suitable for their constitutions as a way to explain this away. Um, you might think again back to Benjamin Rush, right, when he says, okay, well, yes, I guess black people do get yellow fever, but it only happens in these circumstances that have to have an impact on their bodies or, oh, they don't seem to suffer and have the same kind of terrible symptoms. In all of these circumstances, it's kind of giving a little bit to say, perhaps there could be similarity, but no, it's really something deeper within. And so this is sort of what I mean when I say, um, this is a kind of making of racial difference, but making of racial difference in a way that is not just the superficial, what is in color difference, but more along the lines of how bodies respond um, and are susceptible to different diseases. Um, and so if we just move to the, the next slide, um, I would just like to say thank you all for your attention and I very much look forward to the questions. Thank you, Rana, uh, for a very informative and thought-provoking um, talk, presentation. Um, I'd like to, I'm gonna begin with one question of my own, but I'd also like to invite uh, all the members of the audience to read some questions at this stage. Uh, one of the things that struck me reading your book was how you draw out sort of the contemporary relevance of the history that you um, uncover in terms of the tropes about, for instance, racial differences in pain thresholds, uh, you know, that, that you trace back to, to the, your sources. Um, and obviously your book was written before the recent pandemic. So I'd be, I'd be interested um, in your thoughts really on, on the sort of relevances that have, that have been brought into focus since then. Yeah, I know, Sue. So, um, thank you for that question. And I do, I do hope that I can connect some of what I do as a historian to things that are going on today. So um, naturally, um, you know, what struck me during this pandemic um, was this idea of who's an essential worker and who was getting um, sick and who's asked to stay behind and do sort of this dirty work. So I couldn't help but think back to Philadelphia in this sense, right, where you have um, African Americans who are exposing themselves, getting sick with yellow fever because they're the ones, one, they have no means, they can't flee and go to their you know, other house in the countryside. They don't have any place to go. They have to stay behind. And then they're told, okay, well, you're just gonna be fine. And so I think at least in um, the US and a lot of um, urban centers here, folks who are making up essential workers, people who did not have the luxury of Zooming or staying home, who then were exposed to COVID or you know, hospitalized were these essential workers who tended to be um, members of communities of color. And so what you see here is a sense of sort of um, structural racism and these obstacles coming into play, sort of different from Philadelphia, but it, it is true the free African society, though they were free, they were mostly poor. They did not have means and they kind of needed work and needed labor. Um, so there were those parallels, but I also remember, and this was very early on in the pandemic, so like, like March even of 2020, where you know, there was an assumption like, well, it seems to only be happening in Europe or in Italy not yet Africa, maybe this is not going to be a disease that is even going to impact Black people. And, you know, I remember actually speaking to somebody in the media about this, and I said, that's, uh, let's not do that. <laughs> let's not make an assumption that there's just going to be a group of people who's immune or not susceptible just based on their race, right? Um, because I think, and this was kind of um, on multiple levels troubling, you know, folks saying, well, we're not seeing a terrible th uh, calamity happening in, in Africa which is where people just assume that's where it's gonna be the worst at the beginning of the pandemic. Now things have obviously changed, but at first it was Italy. And you know, my impulse is to say, well, Italy tends to have like an older population. So that might be why we're seeing that maybe in relation to countries in Africa, maybe we don't have the same age differential, but there was this impulse to say, okay, well, maybe black people are gonna get it. And even in the US, there were a few people, you know, on social media early on saying, oh, well, this is not a black person issue. And now here we are um, seeing who is making up disproportionate cases of um, uh, sort of hospitalizations or exposure, the higher risk, I should say, is amongst communities of color. So it's, it's always this kind of dangerous reasoning to assume, oh, well, maybe this group is gonna be immune and, and it's sort of the rationale is their race, like a superficial thing like that, rather than looking at the social determinants. And then also just recognizing that people who are essential workers or people who are at risk it may often fall on a racial group, but that's again more telling about social um, obstacles and inequities. 
Thank you. Um, I've got a, another question from a colleague. Thanks for a great talk. What were your expectations about Welcome Collection, uh, or rather, Welcome's Collect Welcome Collections collections? Were there surprises, uh, more or less material than you expected? So, um, I, so let me, I should preface this. So, okay, when I was a very young grad student, I was doing history of medicine. Everyone said, you know, I'm like, I'm interested in 18th and 19th century medicine. I'm interested in race making. I'm going to read as much as I can about like, you know, these renowned physicians. And everybody was like, okay, yeah, you just have to go to the well. Like, it was just like, just go. I was like, okay, of course I'll go. And I wasn't sure what I was going to find. I thought, okay, well, there's published treatises. Um, when I found John Coakley Letson's notes, like the handwritten notes, I almost fell out of my chair because it was as if I was seeing a young, you know, physician, like just taking some scribbly notes about difference, right? Something you might get in lecture. And I thought, okay, I am maybe going to get a window into where these ideas about race come from. Like it's, it's somebody's transmitting this to him, or he's almost saying with finality, it's anatomy. So I was like, okay, I'm just gonna have to keep digging. And what I found was, um, there's a specific, and uh, the name escapes me, sort of the um, army collections, sort of. So this is sort of who staffed the British Naval Hospital in Jamaica. I thought, okay, well, I'll just see if I can get records from there. And I found that most of the surgeons who were stationed in Jamaica all died of some kind of tropical fever. I found, um, you know, a bunch of these handwritten notes. And when I saw Ferguson's notebooks, that was like, um, that like basically changed the trajectory of my of the project because i thought that it was really just going to be you know maybe um thinking about theories of racial difference um looking at lecturing and medical education and then looking primarily at plantations plantation records but the british military records completely kind of reoriented myself so i was able to pair a lot of what i found from the welcome with things that were at um at the national archives at kew and I started to see something that was coherent, like a story was unfolding. And so at that point, I was like, okay, this is going to be, that was actually the first um, chapter that I wrote. It ended up being chapter two in the book, but it was the first thing that I wrote because I, you know, I emailed my advisor and I was like, I can't believe that this is here. Can you believe this? They're making decisions about racial difference. And so all of that, um, a lot of that came from, from the welcome. Um, in fact, most of the things that I have shown you <laughs> Um, particularly around Ferguson um, and what happens in Jamaica is stuff that I got at the Welcome or that I got overseas. Um, I know that there's plenty of, um, uh, of the collections have work on Rush. Um, so, I, I mean, I was going back and forth. It was truly an Atlantic world project, right? So England, um, Philadelphia, and Jamaica, and it was, um, it was amazing. But yeah, the Welcome really, um, it, it steered the trajectory of this chapter. And I actually, I will say this last thing, it was also essential in getting this military, um, these military sources, because um, in the historiography, there was an assumption that any ideas about um, race, sort of the negative things people might say about black people's bodies, or these assumptions about them being fever proof, were always made to defend slavery. Like they were always about slavery, slavery, slavery. Nowhere in Ferguson's writing is that he does not mention slavery at all. Nobody here is saying this, oh, and now we will use them as slaves. They're saying this to say, okay, we want to win wars. We need to survive the tropics. So this was about military strategy. So that kind of opened the door to um, a different way of theorizing the importance of creating race in, in the um, late 18th and 19th. Century. Thank you. Um, so following on from that, do you think there are areas of the history of race and medicine which are underexplored and that Welcome's collection could, could help address? Are there other ones? Hmm, I mean, I, I feel like what I, what I really hope, and I, I have not attempted this one because there's a pandemic, but two, it's, it's sort of like would have to be the third book project, but I'm so interested to understand more about specifically pain tolerance because I want to trace this down. I have Mosley's work, but that's, those are all published. And what I would love to see, and I imagine, right, would possibly be available at the Welcome would be more of these handwritten notes, um, particularly from anyone studying in Europe, um, just what did they say in their lecture notes about pain and surgery in particular? Because I think now what we are finding is, um, you know, very disturbing studies, as I mentioned, that suggest people still hold wrongheaded views about pain differential. 
And so I wonder, right, that it's based on race. I, I would be very curious to see what it was like or what kind of sources are out there in terms of unpublished writings, right? So Mosley is out there, um, Rush is out there, but what other holdings might be there in terms of manuscripts, just handwritten manuscripts? And I would love to, you know, explore more of that. And I know that there are other historians such as myself that are interested in this topic that want to explore not only pain, but I also think attention to skin and skin color. Um, I do know a sort of a separate project that I've, I've done or article I've written on um, vitiligo. There are actual um, images of sort of these um, wonderful spotted people. And there's John Bobby, who's um, a, a Jamaican man who actually expo uh, um, exhibited himself at Bartholomew Fair for money. He's a black person, but he was losing his um, pigment. So what we would say is um, was possibly vitiligo. I know that that source is there at the Welcome because I've cited it and used it. So more of those sources, any kind of collections related to debates about skin and skin color, right? Could it go away? Because some people saw John Bobby as like, could he possibly turn white? Others said, oh, no, no, he's just a spectacle. He's, it, he's just an anomaly. So I think questions about anatomy and skin, and again, I've only dipped my toe into the bit of studying about vitiligo, but that would be something I'd be very keen to, to, to read up on more, and I know other colleagues would be too. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that all sounds very intriguing. Um, going back to the specifics of yellow fever again, so one of the questions is, is the dominant belief that blacks have immunity themselves, they will not get sick, but they are nonetheless infectious, that they'll make others sick? And that is why segregation is advised, or is it that blacks would stand the heat and military fatigue? So it's, I should say for yellow fever, um, there was a huge debate over uh, contagionists versus anti-contagionists. Um, and so I will say that for the most part, black people um, kind of operated in, in sort of two ways. So in the US case in Philadelphia, um, many people blame that outbreak on people fleeing Saint-Domingue. So it's 1793, if we think about what's happening in Haiti, people are fleeing Saint-Domingue and it's planters who are bringing their slaves. Now, interestingly enough, it, no one's really pointing to the slaves per se. They're, they're saying that they, the disease just came from a foreign, it came in, right? It was foreign and they brought disease, like sort of whether they bring the miasma and foul airs with them and now it's penetrated Philadelphia. In some cases, Physicians have referenced black people as non-conductors of yellow fever, as in they can't they can't get it and they won't pass it along. Um, so there is this weird way in which you kind of see a foreign claim of bringing in the disease, which presumably would include both the enslaved people and the planters coming. But then the idea is that well, those enslaved people must not be the source of the disease. And so you find then that that sort of black people inhabit this space where they can, they're expected to do it all. They're expected to, to, to tend to people, they're expected not to get sick. And so interestingly, as far as I can tell, um, in terms of like segregation, I know that the, the, the Corps was, was separate. The West India Corps was completely separate and uh, was commanded by white officers. Um, but in some cases in hospitals, there are references, for example, of um, black people being seen in sort of the same space in the Naval Hospital as, as white um, as white troops. Now, it's unclear if they're there for, for yellow fever or other reasons, but um, I would say to the point of, of segregated um, forces, it's more along just the, the military um, lines and less about yellow fever, like they're going to either infect each other with it. Um, nobody had really landed yet on what caused yellow fever. Some said it was the miasma, some said it was the weather. Some said, I mean, there were so many competing ideas. Um, was it contagious between people? It's only later that we find out that the whole time it had been mosquitoes. So. And so, I mean, that leads on nicely to another question, which is, were there any references to what medicines were used by enslaved African people to cure themselves? So this is, this is actually, um, this is a wonderful question. So here's, Here's what's interesting. Many physicians um, who bothered to write about um, African-based or indigenous-based cures, um, you know, for the most part, it, it's either they were in awe that they worked or they were dismissed as ignorant, right? So it's like, oh, they, they, they anoint themselves in this way or they live in this way. 
In terms of yellow fever, what you do find is this constant reference to the bark, right? So Jesuit's bark, or Chinchona bark, like this is referenced all the time. This is almost like the thing for every fever. Now we do know that that is knowledge from indigenous populations in the Americas, knowing that you should chew the bark. And Europeans sort of quickly take this and run with it um, as a way to, to, to treat. Now, somebody like Benjamin Rush believed in copious bloodletting. Um, now bloodletting is of course the standard of care always the standard of care, um, but he tended to go a little bit further. Now you might think, well, it's a hemorrhagic fever and, and you're right to kind of have that pause, but what he offered was um, bloodletting to sort of calm the fever down. Um, people would either have doses of uh, wine, the bark. Um, there are French physicians who also rely more heavily on the bark, um, but in terms of like a specific um, ritual or practice that Africans employed, um, I'm not seeing that necessarily referenced in relation to yellow fever. Um, in other diseases, um, skin eruptions, for example, like yaws, you do see more of a reference to, to African um, approaches to healing that do actually tend to work a bit better than the heavy metals like mercury that were often applied. Right. Um... So another question, uh, bear with me a second. So, yeah, uh, have you compared the physicians' attitudes to Africans' to attitudes to other groups? Uh, so, and the questioner is just struck by the fact that the regalia was also used by the East India Company and to transport Irish people, convicts, to Australia. So, this is, um, again, kind of like it's it's weird because it, I think with the Irish they're, they're in a special category because at least in the Americas they were not quite white and so they could be prone to certain kinds of um, diseases but they were often you could tell that it was more of a judgmental like anti-immigrant attitude or anti-Irish sentiment of the sense of okay their living habits or living in squalor thus leads them to be predisposed to these kinds of um, diseases, or we don't have to care about cleanliness, or these are people that don't care about cleanliness. I think when you talk about like sort of um, people of um, from this Indian subcontinent, so Indians in that regard, um, you do see similar ideas about their constitutions. So especially thinking about, um, you know, the same kind of tropical fevers and concerns um, that the British are concerned with in the West Indies, they are concerned in the East Indies. And I know, for example, um, uh, Mark Harrison has written extensively on, on sort of actually both regions, but thinking about um, how the English try to sort of tame the environment, but also recognize different bodily differences between people who were um, from the Indian um, subcontinent versus Europeans. So I do actually remember, I do recall that the regalia in this um, instance was actually used again to transport people, even after it was considered to be the source of this great sickness. Um, and I, I imagine, right, the kinds of people, right, who are the people whose bodies are allowed to be on this potentially, you know, poisonous ship, um, are very much sort of influenced by attitudes of race of the day. It would be perfectly fine to like, you know, send these people off or, or even, I believe it was used to send back like convalescing black troops at some point within the Caribbean, but I'm not surprised that it would have been repurposed to use these groups that operated in a sort of non-white category or a lesser or other category, if you like. Thanks. Um, another question. Thank you for a great talk. The medical practice and discourse as you presented supported between 18th and 19th century a racialized understanding of sickness. Are there differences with 17th century regarding color or racialized views from other sickness, or is this particular to 18th, 19th century as a period? So I, first of all, I love that question. And that is actually something that I am, that I actually think about quite a lot because there's, so it's hard to, to sort of parse this, but race, this idea of, of race is actually quite, um, it's a tricky thing, right? It doesn't necessarily ex exist in the same way that we think of it until about the late 18th century. 
in the 16th, there is an idea, okay, people look different and, and there is an attempt we can think about, um, I believe it's um, Bernier starts to write about like classifying groups of people and, and then you have Linnaeus and you have this kind of steady march across time of people classifying. But the real hardened idea of like race as we use it is really doesn't start until the 18th century where people start to say, oh, well, it must be these people fall into this category and they are distinctive. Now I will say this, in the 16th and 17th centuries, people are still operating under, I would argue, like a humoral um, and constitutional environmental understanding of health. So I don't know that people would necessarily use race in the same way, right? So you could even think about the idea of, okay, people who are from this village or in this climate or this geography have these features, right? You can think back to Hippocrates and like the Scythians, if you will. Like this group of people does has this habit, this custom, this is what their waters are like, their environment is like, and these are the diseases they are prone to, or this is their body shape. And so I wonder, again, because I know that race is the slippery thing that doesn't quite exist in the same way yet, I would not be surprised if, if people said, okay, the people of this climate or the people of this group, even thinking back to earlier writings about Africa, right, when, when travelers go there, they remark on the customs, they remark on their bodies and illnesses, but it's not quite in the same fashion. So I, it's almost like attention to race before race formally exists, which is fascinating. And, you know, I wish as I could be like an early modernist and, and go back or to, to hang out with early modernists and sort of see piece together this, this how this progression of, of the crystallization of race and health um, worked out over time. But thank you so much for that, that amazing question. So uh, another, another question. Uh, thank you for a great talk, really interesting. I wonder if you found any examples of black individuals who endorse this idea of black immunity as a way of stressing perhaps physical strength or endurance. Ah, okay. So, let me think, because I, I, I want to be very clear here in terms of endorsing an idea of physical strength. Um, you know, it turns out, at least not from what I have seen in this era, have I seen an endorsement of this idea. In fact, um, you know, it, it tends to be a case of people tell us that we're different, but I'm here to give you an example of how we're, we're, we're actually not that different. So I can think of James McCune Smith, for example, um, the African-American physician who actually had to train in, in, in Glasgow because he couldn't get a medical degree in the United States. Um, he, uh, you know, was actually trying to make the case that he's like, we're, we're actually more similar. We should stop saying that there are these differences. Now, what I do think is interesting, though, is thinking about in more contemporary times where I have most certainly heard people who may identify as Black and say, oh, well, you know, sickle cell is a black disease that's our disease and it's sort of like oh okay it's it's kind of it's not in the sense of endurance it's saying that this is a special thing that we need to have attention for and this was sort of reinforced in um the 1970s when richard nixon actually signed into the sickle cell anemia research act but the issue is is we know that that's still a fiction sickle cell anemia is is more of a molecular disorder and you don't have to be black to get it it, it can be people who are you know from the mediterranean or elsewhere so i have heard a kind of discourse more recently, right, more, more uh, recent times of people trying to say this affects us as a racial group, but not as a sense of trying to pathologize, but not necessarily in a sense of saying we are really wrong or fit. It's more in a sense that we deserve the attention and research monies because this is something that affects just our population. Uh, but that's, that is a really good question. And then I think we've only got time for one more question. Um, so have you found any of the physicians making gender an important issue? From memory, they write about men quite a bit, but I wonder if some might also use the idea of being immune to pain, uh, thinking about its application to women and childbirth. Um, that is, they're absolutely spot on. So um, there are a number of great, um, uh, scholars who have really focused on this gender and particularly childbearing. So women's reproduction is sort of a key uh, topic. So I will say this, for, for example, so I know um, that Catherine Paw's work um, on, she's worked on, on this, I know um, she has, uh, Sasha Turner has as well, but the idea here is that 
gender is essential actually in making of race and also in delimit delineating different kinds of femininity. So most absolutely there is this idea that African women either they either have a very easy time with childbirth, it doesn't bother them, or they have trouble in reproducing, this is a real problem in Jamaica because they have a low birth rate, due to an innate predisposition for promiscuity. So those kinds of like those discourses are out there. So it's either they it's easy to have ch children or they can't have children. These are for them to give birth, I should say, and they can't have children. And it's all because they are considered to be or they described in terms that are more animalistic than with white women. Now, I will say, because there's always a, a caveat, uh, John Quire, who is an English physician who worked in Jamaica, he um, was known for conducting these unethical experiments with smallpox on enslaved people. But he also, um, in, in sort of sharing his work back and forth with people in London, he mentioned that he kind of pushed back on the idea that black women had easy childbirth. He said, oh, well, they also have pain too. But of course he says this as a person who was responsible for having forcibly impregnated a number of enslaved women. So he knew this only because he was in a position where he either claimed that these women did struggle. Now you might say, oh, he's humanizing them, but it's also under the circumstances of their sexual coercion. So I would say for the most part though, there is an idea that um, that pain tolerance is most absolutely um, signals you know, with uh, black women that that is almost always present when discussing um, reproduction or labor. Um, so again, really great question there. Unfortunately, um, that only leaves me time to once again, thank Rana uh, for a thought provoking, uh, informative and I think important talk um, and to invite you all to join us on 26th of October when we'll be uh, experiencing ear trumpets in the enlightenment with Dr. Ruben Gerwal. Uh,